Hi, my name is Frankie. Thank you for listening to my mom. I never listen. So pleased to be joined on Nothing But Net with the head coach from Bradley University, Kate Popovic Goss. Kate, it's great to see you. Thank you for being on uh, the podcast with us. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So, um, all right, let's break it down a little bit. Like, how's it going? This is your first head coaching job and you're in a really challenging league playing a tough non-conference schedule. What's it been like so far? Um, it's been crazy. Uh, but I think, you know, I've been very pleased with just the growth of our team and the fact that they're really invested in what we're trying to do. Um, every day is definitely a challenge and you're getting hit with a thousand things, but, um, I think it's a lot of fun when you enjoy your staff and, and you enjoy your team. And, and that's something I've been really lucky to deal with in my first year, because it can go a lot of different directions. So enjoying that for sure. Well, enjoying your staff has to partly be because you have your husband on your staff with you, right? So what's that like? I mean, there's not many, I can think of a few, the Curry's at Alabama or um, the Harper's um, at Tennessee, but there's not too many where the wife's the head coach and the husband's the assistant or vice versa. Yeah. Um, you know, it's enjoyable. I always joke that uh, everyone thinks I'm the crazy one, but in reality, it's him because not only is he married to me, he chose to work with me too. Um, but, you know, our dynamic, I think it's it's been fun. It's been new. Um, we've worked together our entire careers. That's how we've met. But to be in this capacity where we're both coaches um, and, you know, obviously he's an assistant is different, but I think the biggest challenge for us is just knowing how to shut it down. Um, we're really passionate about what we do. We love it. And so, you know, we have to make some rules for the house, uh, because he has the ability to like talk about something and move forward from it. Whereas I do not like, it'll just ruinate my brain for forever. So, um, we set some boundaries, but it's, it's been a lot of fun. And, and I think my staff too, um, it's not an easy dynamic always for people to work with. Right. And so that was something I was really forthright about in my hiring process. And, everyone has just embraced it. And I think it actually provides some comic relief, like when we're bickering or, you know, the girls think it's hysterical and um, it's, it's been a lot of fun though. We, we really enjoy it. So, all right. What are some of the rules? Like when you go home and, and you're not always home at the same time, and I'm sure there's probably not a prepared meal on the table at dinner time every night. How's it work? I had been really good in the, in the non, like in the preseason about cooking every night. Cause I love cooking and then not just like went out the window. So we're just, we're, we're flying, we're figuring it out. But um, no, like when we're on the second floor of our house, where like our bedroom is at and all that stuff, no basketball, no work talk. We're not allowed to, that's like a boundary we have. We try and shut it down. I'm like, after nine, you should not be talking to me about a recruit or about film or anything like that. And then too, when we do sit down and have dinner, we try and like make that not work talk. So we're getting there. We're navigating it. Um, like I said, he usually breaks the rules. So uh, he's he'll come up, uh, you know, before bed and talk about a call he had or something he just watched on film. And I'm just like, no, 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 because I'll go to sleep with that in my brain. So we got to try and move forward. But um, it's been it's been really good so far. So if you're a cook, what are some of the things that are your famous dishes? What are you famous for? You got to have something that you can just whip out like that for dinner. Shrimp Caesar salads. That Sweet. is the go-to shrimp Caesars. I like invented this recipe randomly. I mean, it's not that complicated, but you know, seasoning the shrimp is the key part, but that takes like 20 minutes. Cause I just prep all the food beforehand. Like when I get them from the grocery store. So literally you're just defrosting the shrimp, cooking it and getting it going. Simple. It's gotta be simple and fast. That's the yes. way it is at my house. Uh, or everybody knows what the pizza number is. And uh, my kids grew up <laughs> thinking that when the, somebody rang the doorbell at the front door, they thought it was pizza was, you know, every time. Um, That's um, great. And I'm going to take that forward with me. <laughs> so I met you a while back as a player at Pitt. And I know that you've had lots of different influences in your life. And we will get to Joe McEwen, who is a mutual friend. But just talk about, um, you know, the whole process of figuring out where you want to go to school, and then, you know, transferring and because that's where the climate is in our game, right? It's trying to figure out where you want to go. And if it's not the right fit for whatever reasons, there's a million reasons why uh, that that you find another way to improve your opportunity to, to grow. W what would you say about that conversation? Yeah, I think, um, you know, for me, the choice to go to the University of Pittsburgh, I was a hometown kid and, and Pitt was an hour and 15 minutes from where I grew up. 
And at the time, um, it was a it was a program on the rise, which was really appealing to me. They had made, you know, Agnes Baranato had done a tremendous job turning that program into a powerhouse in the Big East at the time when the Big East was the best basketball conference in the country. Notre Dame, UConn, Louisville. My freshman year, Louisville and UConn played for the national title game and we finished third behind them. Um, and so that choice to go there was was rooted heavily in that, the academic piece of it, obviously. I think the one thing that um if I could give advice to recruits and when I talk to them is, is really being mindful of style of play. And I think that that was what factored the most into my decision to transfer was the fact I, I really was better suited for a league like the big 10. Um, there was no secret about that. I think everyone was in agreement and kind of understood my choice, which is why I was able to maintain the relationships with the coaches um, upon leaving. But I think that, you know, as I journey through my, my coaching career, um, transferring ended up kind of being a blessing in disguise because I know how to navigate that process as both a student and a coach. Um, I play for multiple staffs, but I built a lot of relationships. And I think back to a lot of the things that I went through at Pitt with Agnes um, and some of the things that she was just amazing at. And, you know, I carry those with me as well. Um, I don't think that there's someone who is better with a microphone in her hands, engaging the community, um, fundraising, and really just building morale behind a culture and a team. She was a big family person. She had five, she has five kids. Yeah. We were in a house all the time. And um, I take those things with me from her. And uh, I'm grateful for that experience that I had. And also it really helped me when I went to the universe or when I went to Northwestern because Northwestern was rebuilding at that time too. So I'd been through that process and um, as an athlete. I love bringing up some names from our past, right? Because Agnes Baranato had a, a tremendous influence on me. I have three kids. She had five. I sat in her kitchen many times watching what was going on. I mean, she had rules, no TV. You know, they had to study during the week. Um, she had some rules when the kids were growing up. I've been to mass at her house before. Um, give us one story about Agnes Baranato that you remember from back in the day that, um, would help personify who Agnes is because I know exactly what you're talking about being in her house. It's like traffic cop in there and there was stuff happening all the time. It was like, you could sit there like Mr. Magoo and you're paying attention to one thing, but there's 15 things happening at the same time. It was mass chaos. And there was like no better multitasker than Agnes. Um, like I seriously, I remember she used to say like, she used to drink coffee in the shower and like, just get through the day. But for me, I don't think it's necessarily as many like one like word memories, but it's like her catchphrases, right? So like, it was always, you got to put your big girl panties on and suit up and get in the game. Like, let's go. And, um, you know, she would always, if anytime she cussed, she would always apologize to Christ and say she was going to say a Hail Mary. You know, she was just like the absolute best. But I think the biggest thing about, about Agnes is like the Energizer Bunny Man. She was never tired. I'm like, you have five kids. Your house is just chaotic we're chaotic like and every single day she just brought it and I think the one thing too like she was always there for a hug she was always there for a high five and she was always on the court still like boxing you out and like doing just crazy stuff she was the best um at that and then I just I look back at that energy and in that she just has like a zest to her um and even through her battles with breast cancer I think just the positivity she's maintained and the advocacy right like it's huge. Yeah. And I think if you want to look at what she's done for women's basketball, I think that that speaks large, largely to who she is. I'm going to call Agnes based on our conversation. And if anybody's listening that has Agnes's number, give her a buzz. I know she'd love to hear from you. Who knows where she is? I mean, I no idea. You know, she, no. Could, <laughs> she could be in the Keys. She could be in Pittsburgh. She could be in Atlanta. Uh, she could be with her grandchildren. We we don't really know, but we know whatever she's doing, she's definitely bringing the energy for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, what a great mentor for me as well. Um, yeah. I used to say, I haven't slept, and I still say, I haven't slept since 1995 after my first kid was born. So that's kind of the way Agnes rolls, right? It's really yeah. fun. Um, when you um, think about winning a Big Ten championship as a player at Northwestern, and you think about the components that come with building championship caliber teams what would be a couple of things that you may have learned as a player that you have employed as a coach to try to get your players to understand what championship culture means yeah um I think culture is you know it's like a buzzword right everyone talks about culture and building culture and, and for us we talk about four things when we talk about culture um I have what's called pillars in my program um and their family accountability resiliency and joy um and, you know, we talk about those things. And I think that 
the biggest thing that I'm looking to implement in my culture and the best things that I learned from being a player to being a coach that's coached a Big Ten championship team is that your best locker rooms are player-led locker rooms, not coach-led locker rooms. And it takes time to build that. And that's the battle that we're going through here at Bradley right now. Um, you want your players being the ones that control the locker room, not your coaches, um, you know, supporting each other, building a family feel. Um, we can cultivate it, but it really has to be implemented and upheld by your players. And so I think that that's when I look back to my playing days and when I look back to the best teams I participated on and played on and also the best teams I've coached, it was the players holding one another accountable to a standard of excellence, not the coaches. Um, we got to just coach. We got to, you know, strategize. We got to lead. But at the end of the day, you know, when I was at Northwestern, it was Lindsey Pulliam's voice. It was Veronica Burton's voice. Um, you know, when I was at the University of Pittsburgh, it was Shavante Zellis and Xenia mm -hmm. Stewart. Um, they set the tone for who we were. And uh, it allowed the coaches to do what they do best. And that's coach the game strategize, know the X's and O's, and, and we went out and we did what we were supposed to do. So that was, I think, what we're looking to build right now. Um, and I have a lot of players going through those battles on the court. Every single kid I have, regardless of whether they're a junior or whether they're a freshman, has very little on-court experience in a large role. I have kids playing 35 minutes that at most were playing 10 to 12. And that's a huge shift. So right now they're navigating what that looks like, not only for themselves, but then they're trying to lead each other. And so as they go through those battles and we continue to recruit in two years, those kids are going to be the ones that are laying the foundation for what our locker room should look like, because they're going to have been there, done that at a very high level. And so um, right now, I think our kids are committed to that. And I don't know if they know or understand that's what they're going through right now, but in two years, um, they will at a really high level. So I'm excited to continue to be a part of their growth and their journey. You mentioned the word joy, which I love because, you know, you can't be in this business this long unless you love it. I absolutely love all the things that come with it. And, you know, when you sit down and do a game for two hours in my role, you know, there's so much stuff that you do behind the scenes to get ready. And there's a lot of stuff that nobody even knows, right? But the pure joy of doing what we do because we love the game. When I'm in the gym and I'm all over the place right now and I get to see a lot of players, the two things that I always say to them is, are you grateful for what you have? And are you working hard? Because at the end of the day, if you're grateful, then you'll have a positive attitude and you'll bring energy and you'll be thankful for what you're doing. And if you're working hard, it's going to take care of itself inside the game. Because if you're working hard in the game, you're going to make the game easier for your teammates. So if you do those two things, you have to extrapolate some joy from it. It's not about how many points you scored. There's so much more to it. What do you say to your players when they're you know, losing their confidence or they're, they're not feeling that joy that you and I share for the love of the game. Yeah. You know, I, th I think for, for me, the biggest goal I've had in coming in is just being really transparent and, you know, um, basketball, as you know, is really, this is all about life, right? Like the lessons they learn in these four years translate to hopefully their jobs, their careers, their families, like you and I are talking about, right? Um, and so when they're losing confidence, I think my job is to really navigate whether they need a jolt from me or whether they need a kick from me. And, um, you know, we had to have a conversation. We lost two games by three points each. Um, and we're right there. And what I sensed in my kids was they felt sorry for themselves. And now, you know, it's okay. We're sad because we lost and it is hard to lose. No one said it was going to be easy to lose. And no one said this is going to be fun of every moment of every day. Um, but at the same time, I told them self-pity is poison. No one feels sorry for you. And, and the biggest thing that I think that you all have been told in your lives is that people genuinely are always going to be concerned about how you feel. That's not always the case. And what you need to do is within each other, lift each other up. And I said, so right now, we don't need to point fingers. We need to extend our hands to one another. So if your teammate doesn't have it and you do that day, bring your teammate with you right? My job as a coach is if I recognize you need that boost, I'm going to give you my hands and pick you up. And I think that really resonated with them. And that was the day before we went and won it. Um, Eastern Illinois is like you said, be grateful, but also be selfless, right? Yeah. If, and that's where you're a family, that's where you build. Not everyone has great moments all the time, but you know what? I guarantee you out of 14 kids, someone is having a good day. So right. make it contagious, be the voice, be the person, because that energy, just like negativity, 
is contagious. And that's the switch that we flipped. And I was really proud of my team because it's hard to do when you lose two games by three points, those are daggers. And I just told them they have a choice and the choice is theirs. And I don't know what the outcome will be, but make the choice to give everything you have, because I promise you at some point that is going to pay off, whether it's today, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's three months from now in the middle of conference. And they did. And they found the joy in that experience, right? Like, okay, we're going to band together and figure this out. And like you said, that joy comes from that. And it really, for me, I think was my favorite um, experience as far as a head coach was they did that, not me. You know, I watched them pull themselves up by the bootstraps and put their big girl panties on, like Agnes would say, and go do it. And um, that was really exciting for me as a young coach and to watch them as a young team grow into that experience because um, it is really hard, as you know, but there's beauty in the struggle. And um, I think that they're starting to feel it a little bit. So hopefully we continue to grow in that. Kate, as you're talking, you know, I'm leaning in, like you're pulling me in, you're pulling me in. I can feel it, right? Um so what would Joe say in that moment when you've lost two? Joe McEwen, the great coach at Northwestern, the longtime advocate for the women's game and supporter of all women's sports. What would Joe McEwen, the head coach at Northwestern, say about losing those two games uh, by a, a, a possession and then coming back out the next night and digging in? You know, I think the one thing Joe always had a sense for was what his team needed in the moment. Um and there were times where you would expect him to be super mad and maybe behind the scenes he was, you know, cause he's tremendously competitive. And when he would go to the team, he had the ability to, to literally shape shift in a moment to what his team needed. And, you know, and I think in those moments he would do exactly what I did. He would either challenge the team if he sensed it, or he would be the one to look at us in practice and say, you know what, these kids are really down. And we need to make it fun today, whether that's they're competing on every possession, whether it's, you know, he's at half court doing a dance, whatever it is. And I think so, like every game was different in a sense of what he sensed they needed. But I think that his feel for people is what has made him so successful in this business um, and his feel for relationships. And that's something that like I always carry with me is, you know, his ability to step outside the moment and take a breath and go, OK what is best for my team right now. And um, as a head coach, and as you know, as a mother, and you're always challenged to do that and put your emotions to the side to go, okay, what makes sense? And so I think for him, that was always something I really learned and he kept it, he kept it different. It was never always the same. He was always a little unpredictable in that sense, but that was probably one of his greatest strengths and is his greatest strength. Kate, when you were a player at Northwestern, you had some health challenges. Do you want to share what some of those were? Uh, yeah. So, um, and, uh, practice. So I had transferred to Northwestern. I sat out an entire year. That's when you still had a red shirt when you transferred. Um, and you know, I was poised to really play a big role on our Northwestern team. And it was about a few weeks before our first game. So what would have been my first game in a year? Um, I was having tachycardic episodes in my heart. And so I didn't know what that meant, but I just knew my heart rate was fluttering in practice. And I just, I was, I couldn't get my heart rate down. I just felt like, wow, my heart just will not, will not chill out. So I walk over to the trainer and I'm just like, you know, Hey Jen, my, you know, I just feel like I can't slow my heart rate down. Like, I don't know if I'm dehydrated or, you know, just tough warm up or whatever. And she's like, okay. So she puts the pulse X monitor, which reads your pulse on my finger and she just shakes her head and she goes, Oh, that can't be right. It must be your nail polish. My nails are always done. And, um, she goes, tried to find my, you know, pulse just by taking it on my wrist and she couldn't get it. And so she did it again. She was like, okay, so call the ambulance. And it turns out I had um, a condition in my heart where essentially it got stuck in a rhythm and um, couldn't get out of the rhythm itself. And so uh, I ended up having a pacemaker implanted. Um, and, you know, I was told I would never play again. And uh, I didn't really like that. So I challenged it um, in my own way. And mm -hmm you know, credits to, you know, Northwestern University and um, my coaches and obviously the medical staff, because uh, I'm technically not what, what's called a full pacemaker dependent. So if something were to happen to my pacemaker, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't die. Obviously it wouldn't be good, but it was, you know, if, so I was able to play, but I was never able to really um, return to 
who I was. I really struggled with the high intensity of basketball just at the time. And, and there still is, there's not a lot of, you know, athletes that compete with pacemakers and there's not a lot of knowledge surrounding, you know, that level of intensity in athletics and, and pacemaker dependence. I'm part of point zero two percent or something ridiculous wow. under the age of 60 with a pacemaker. Um, so, you know, but the fact that I was able to try and play and at least get out there and, and have half of the season, you know, at least I got to say that I did. And that was a big, a big thing for me, but um, yeah, it was, it was crazy. But I think ultimately I always look at that and go, my impact was never meant to be made in a stat book. It was meant to be made on the sidelines. And that's really in those challenges where I, um, I knew I wanted to coach, but that's where I knew it was like meant for me, right? Like that was it. And so, um, yeah, it was a really challenging time. Um, and it still is, you know, I still, I miss playing. I don't think I would have been done playing after college. I definitely think I would have pursued it professionally. So, um, it was a huge loss, you know, when you lose your career due to a health issue, which so many athletes do, whether it's the knee a heart or whatever, it's, you know, it's, it's really hard. Um, and I was just grateful because throughout that time I was really supported. Um, and, you know, especially by my coaches and administration at Northwestern, I never felt that I wasn't, I didn't matter, even though my on-court experience was never what it was supposed to be. Well, that's what this podcast is all about. Nothing but net is sort of taking your shot, right? Like what are the things that you have learned about your past and you've experienced that it will allow you to be really present in the moment and a good teacher for your students, right? So nothing but net, okay? Take your last shot. What What's your last shot here on nothing but net? Um, you know, I just am super grateful to be in this position. And I think the the best thing that I have continued to learn and I want to continue to emphasize is you win with people. And um, in a business that can be tremendously polarizing, highly competitive, um, the most important thing to me will always be the people and the relationships. And I think that that really is the foundation of what winning programs are built on and will always be built on. And um, that's our goal here. So I am just really uh, thankful for you, you know, taking the time with me and also diving into my past and talking about those relationships that I've had um, and the growth that I've been able to experience because of my mentorship. So hopefully, hopefully someday everyone's talking about my catchphrases on here with you and, you know, making fun <laughs> of me and teasing and all that good stuff. But no, um, I just think you win with people. And that's something I really want to continue to hold true as we move forward. So looking forward to the rest of the year. And thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk with me this morning.